Okay, with the recent chaos that has transpired involving Mike Babcock, I thought it would be a good time to walk down memory lane. Take a look at coaches who were fired, kicked to the curb because of a star player. And who better to start with than Punch Imlach? Because back in the 60s, all the way up to the 80s, it was reported that he would not only mentally abuse his players with his drill sergeant mentality, no, he would also hit his players. I mean, the guy's name is Punch, maybe that's why, I don't, I don't know. And to show the extent of how coaches would focus on psychological warfare, we have to fast forward to the 1980s. Because after making a return to Toronto, Punch Imlach was not only the coach, but the GM of the team. This is a scary power dynamic, as coaches in this time period were known to threaten the careers of their players. So not only did Punch have the ability to bench or scratch a player, he had the power to bury a player in the minors, ending their time in the NHL. And right off the bat, before the season even started, Punch would begin trashing the Leafs on TV. He would also ban players from making TV appearances. Thus, he would begin to butt heads with Daryl Sittler. Why? Sittler at this point was a Leafs legend. He was the man who took the role as captain because he wanted to be the voice of the team. He took pride in mentoring and leading his team to success. And he was not going to allow an old school coach to walk into his team and abuse his teammates. Not only that, in this period, Sittler was a main figure for the NHLPA, an organization that empowers the players. And Punch hated that. If that isn't a massive red flag, then I don't know what is. This friction got so bad that Punch would immediately attempt to trade Sittler. However, Sittler had a no trade clause, specifically the part where he would be paid 500,000 cash, or with inflation, 1.8 million if he were to be traded. And this would piss off Punch. So much so, he would trade Sittler's best friend, Lanny McDonald, purely out of spite. And then it would happen. Upon hearing this news, Sittler would storm to the dressing room and cut the C off his jersey in protest. He would then write ownership, a heartbreaking letter of resignation, stating that him being named captain was the happiest day of his life. But with the current state of the team ran by Punch, it was intolerable. In what world does tormenting your franchise player make sense? It doesn't, and it never will. Keep in mind, Lanny McDonald was the heart and soul of the team, and he would soon after use this heart and soul to lead the Flames to their first Stanley Cup. As this situation highlights how power obsessed coaches, when they have their frail ego bruised, they will do anything in their power to send a message, even if it means dismantling their own team. The next season, Punch would be fired. But it was too late, as Sittler felt betrayed by the organization, and the Leafs would trade him to the Flyers. So, to summarize, Punch would join the team expecting his wrath to work. Sittler, being the man of the people, would stand up against him. And within one year, the team would fall apart, due to an egomaniac. Next, we're gonna take a look at the bizarre tenure of Barry Melrose. Because back in 2008, Melrose would be hired to be the next coach of the Tampa Bay Lightning, as he would sign a three-year, $2.25 million contract, which at the time was big money. And during this era, Tampa went from winning the cup in 04 to a massive fall from grace by 2008, as they would finish last place. But they would draft the next franchise player, Steven Stamkos. Except, and I kid you not, Barry Melrose was on a power trip. And considering the team was predominantly made up of veterans, coaches who were obsessed with power tend to take it out on the young players. And this would be the case with Stamkos. Melrose would start Stamkos on the fourth line. There were games where Stamkos played six minutes. In what world does playing your dynamic first overall pick on the fourth line make sense? And as a result, Stamkos would have a horrendous start to his career, as he would put up two goals in his first 16 games. But here's the thing, coaches in the NHL tend to have an expiry date. Even if you are a great coach, your message will begin to fade. Most of the time, it takes years. But for Melrose, and I kid you not, the entire team was sick of him after 16 games, especially with the treatment of Stamkos. 
as Stamkos would have two goals, four points in those games. Tampa would hire Rick Tockett, where he would see the obvious potential of Stamkos. He would finish the final 30 games of the season with 17 goals, 27 points. Or, you know, just a nice 47 goal pace. This right here is the impact of a coach who believes in his players. This is also a story about how burying high-end talent in the bottom six stagnates a prospect's growth. <clears throat> New York Rangers. Yep, New York Rangers. Next, we have the notorious Marc Messier versus Vancouver Saga. Because back in 1994, we would see a heated Stanley Cup matchup. And well, we know the result. New York Rangers are the Stanley Cup champions! Apparently this, uh, this man was playing O Canada. Because heading into the 1997 season, the Vancouver Canucks who fell just short of recruiting Wayne Gretzky would then pivot to sign Marc Messier, the man who just destroyed them in the finals, where he would sign a contract with a 6 million AAV or 11.5 million in today's money. And not only that, Marc Messier would also gain phantom ownership of the team. So the Canucks would pay out the wazoo to sign Messier as they had high hopes that he would be the final piece to a cup win. However, as soon as Messier got to Vancouver, the drama commenced. To start, fearing there would be friction between Trevor Linden and Messier, and considering Messier was known as the greatest leader of all time, Linden would give the captaincy to Messier. And before playing a single game, this would cause a rift in the locker room, as Trevor Linden was the heart and soul of the team. And it didn't feel right to give the C to the guy who just tormented them in the cup finals. He would also wear past Canucks legend, Wayne Mackey's number 11, which was not sitting well with the fan base. But that was just the start. As Marc Messier, even though he was a player, he had the power to do whatever he wanted. And he would soon fire head coach Tom Rennie and legendary GM Pat Quinn. And he would replace them with Mike Keenan, as Keenan coached the Rangers to a cup in 94. Not only that, where Keenan would take the role as head coach and general manager. And soon after this hiring, Mike Keenan would start to dismantle the team as he would trade Trevor Linden to the Islanders. He would trade Kirk McQueen, Dave Babbage, and worse yet, Gino Ottage. Keep in mind, these players were fan favorites. So within one year, the Vancouver Canucks were a completely different team. To the hands of Messier and Keenan, they were stripped of their identity. But okay, maybe these moves were the right decision. No, not even close, as these moves would end in disaster. As the Canucks went from making the playoffs and being serious competitors the previous five seasons, and during Messier's tenure, not only was he not the final piece to a cup, the Vancouver Canucks would fail to make the playoffs. And Messier in this period would have the lowest production of his entire career. And after his three-year contract was over, the Canucks team was a shell of its former self. And for extra salt to the wounds, Marc Messier would then pack his bags and make a return to the Rangers. Not only that, he would sue the Vancouver Canucks for not upholding their contract and ownership agreements. I mean, I can't blame him, but after his disastrous tenure, you can understand why Marc Messier is now the most hated man in Canucks history. Is it not crazy that even 40 years ago, a man gets given the name Punch as a cute little nickname? If this man is punching his players, it speaks volume. You know, like, what does he do with his family? To me at least, I, I get that times have changed, but this man is still cherished as a builder of the NHL, like, like, good job. You had success from mentally abusing and punching your players, like, is that not absurd? Why are we celebrating a tyrant? Like, imagine if someone got a DUI, kill the family in a car crash. And we're just like, aw, look at little drunky Killy there. Leave him alone, silly drunky Killy. Can you name a coach who got fired for a bizarre reason, whether it's a player or it's something else? Comment down below. The guaranteed Connor McDavid pack is still in stock. Or you are chasing this beautiful auto or perhaps rookie cards. Link is down below. And as always, thanks for watching.